Welcome. On behalf of RSNA, I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar called Maintaining Influence as Imaging Moves Beyond Radiology. The RSNA and I would like to thank Highland Healthcare for sponsoring today's webinar. My name is Reggie Munden. I am the Chair of Radiology at the Milk University of South Carolina. With us today, we have Dr. Cheryl Petersill, Dr. Bill Way, Dr. Janet Reed, and Dr. Susan Ackerman on our panel. Before I introduce our speakers, allow me to take a care of a few items. This webinar is one of the many ways that the RSNA is reaching the radiology community to provide education and resources for your needs. Today's webinar will be recorded and available free for the RSNA Online Learning Center, as well as the RSNA's YouTube channel. Please use the question panel on your site to submit questions. You may upvote someone else's question by clicking on the heart icon. This will help us select questions that are of most interest to the audience. And we certainly want this to be interactive session with plenty, and we will try and leave plenty of time to address your questions. So let me introduce our uh, distinguished panel of speakers. Dr. Peter Silge is president and founder of Adagos, an enterprise imaging strategy firm. She's a respected physician and imaging leader, a pioneer in enterprise imaging with a deep knowledge of healthcare informatics. She's recognized among the top professionals in her field, participated in developing the digital imaging adoption model and leads the hospital and um, Society of Imaging Informatics, Medicine Enterprise Imaging Community Photo Documentation Workgroup. Dr. Bill Way is in private practice as a body imager for over 30 years and has served as Chief Medical Officer of his practice of 50 radiologists for about 15 years. As CMO, his responsibilities are to coordinate the activities of their 15 member IT staff. Capitalizing on the IT infrastructure has been critical to their success and enable them to succeed in their very competitive market. Dr. Janet Reed is an attending physician and vice chair of education in the Department of Radiology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She holds a Patricia Bourne's Endowed Chair of Radiology Education. And Dr. Susan Ackerman is a professor of radiology and vice chair of clinical affairs in the radiology of the, of the Department of Medical University of South Carolina. Her primary area of interest include breast cancer imaging and ultrasound imaging of transplant organs. So thank you for your responses. Those are interesting. Today's session is really driven by uh, this current PAC systems or picture archiving communication systems that we're well, with, well aware of the lifeblood of our specialty. For the past 30 years, digital imaging have been standardized by a DICOM format, but the problem of storage of those images into proprietary PAC systems has meant that as they've been difficult to access those images unless you're using a proprietary type PAX viewing system. And many of us who've been in this business well remember the days of having to purchase those systems for $100,000, $140,000 per archive, uh, per PAX imaging viewing system. It's interesting to note that the first large scale PAX installation was at the University of Kansas in 1982. And so they've been around for quite a long time, but they really proliferated, proliferated in the 1990s. And today, all of us depend on PACs to practice. The problem is the storage and capacity of those PACs has been expensive and difficult to switch from one PAC system to another as one aged out. And this increased uh, utilization and need for changing PACs has been exacerbated by the growth in teleradiography services, as well as expanding healthcare systems as they purchase other hospital systems and the cost of deploying those new PACs or incorporating those PACs systems has been unsustainable. So in response, somewhat in response to that, vendor neutral archives or so-called VNAs are now being deployed throughout large health systems pretty regularly. 
And these allow the storage of any image, radiology, cardiology, dermatology, pathology of any type to be stored into a central server. And then individuals will use their viewing system to pull images out of that server. The difficulty for radiology is that previous to VNAs being deployed, essentially all imaging was controlled by radiology. PAC systems were selected and used by radiologists. Storage systems to support those PACs were predominantly done with radiology input. But as we move to storing multiple kinds of images, particularly pathology images, the control of those systems has fallen more and more into hospital informatics systems and radiology's influence in that system and in that selection could be a threat. In fact, one can imagine that radiologists may not be the one choosing a viewing system if a hospital system decides the best and most uh, or the cheapest system is one that maybe the pathologists choose. And now we're having to use viewing systems that perhaps are not ideally set for our practices. On top of that, who controls and who manages the storage of images into a VNA? How is the quality of those images maintained? How is access to those images uh, controlled through appropriate criteria? And maybe one good example of this impact with VNAs and imaging spreading outside of radiology is the point of service ultrasound. All of us are faced with these proliferating ultrasound handheld units. Many institutions are deploying them. In fact, some medical schools are giving medical students handheld ultrasounds at first year of medical school. So it's replacing the stethoscope. So in all of this expansion of VNAs, expansion of imaging outside of the radiology traditional domains, the question is how do we as radiologists maintain influence in that broadening world? And so these questions are, we're opposing to our panelists and to you. And we'd like for you to have some input and submit some questions to us about your thoughts on these issues. So please post your questions or comments on the chat page as we progress. Now, Dr. Pittosilge cannot be with us today, but she was uh, kind enough and capable of, of uh, pro, uh, recording a message for us to see at the beginning. And so we will go to her as our first panelist and have a short video from her. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. I really wanna thank RSNA and Hyland and Dr. Munden for including me in this webinar. This is a topic that I am very passionate about and really appreciate the opportunity to um, share my thoughts with all of you who are attending this webinar. So I'm going to do a brief introduction to enterprise imaging and then give an overview of some of the topics that are going to be discussed later today. So on your slide, you could see um, my graphical representation of what an enterprise imaging architecture will look like. That architecture is going to focus around a centralized image archive, which is known or is typically a vendor neutral archive, but there are other ways to simulate a uh, central archive, which we're not gonna talk about today. That archive is going to serve as the hub for image management activities, as well as the hub for all exchange programs. So you have a single point of entry into and out of the organization, streamlining interoperability, which is really a large consideration in 2021. And it's also going to be the source of images for the universal viewer that is going to distribute images to your providers, whether they're in the office, out of the office, and as well as to the patients. And as you could see, there are going to be several different imaging activities that are going to be feeding the VNA. We have the traditional radiology and cardiology based DICOM imaging modalities, and those imaging systems come with their own diagnostic viewer, which is often supported by a short-term archive. 
But radiology and cardiology are no longer the only departments with PACs or dedicated image management systems. We see the same architecture occurring in ophthalmology, um, endoscopy, OBGYN, and many other departments throughout the organization. And in my mind, when you have an enterprise imaging program, these diagnostic systems are separate from the enterprise imaging program. You have to take into consideration the diagnostic tools that are required by each one of those departments. Then you have the point of care images. These are images that are acquired with systems that don't have the full image management capabilities. So for example, you might be acquiring photography on your iPhone and you need a way to get that into your VNA or point of care ultrasound that's going to be acquired on units that are used in the midst of a clinical visit. And in that situation, there's no order that's been placed. And so we need to get those images um, appropriately identified. We need to associate the appropriate metadata. These images also should be managed within the enterprise imaging system. And they're gonna acquire some different tools that we haven't seen in our environments before enterprise imaging. And I call those workflow management tools. And those tools are typically part of your VNA. They don't have to be, but oftentimes they are. And I know point of care ultrasound, which is the POCUS here, is something that's going to be a um, large part of the discussion today. But before we move on to that, I know there's a real concern about what's happening to the radiologist and what's the role of the radiologist as we move into this new architecture. And in my mind, radiologists are the imaging specialists. They have the greatest depth of knowledge about image management. And so I believe in addition to their role in managing their diagnostic systems, the radiologist should play a very large role in um, the management of the VNA as well as the exchange programs in the enterprise viewer. They, among all of these different imaging specialties, are also going to be the largest um, generator of images by many, many magnitudes. And so just by virtue of that, um, they really should maintain a strong voice in what goes on. But with that said, I do think radiologists need to have a view that extends beyond the radiology department. And that is an enterprise focus. There's a lot of shift to systemness in many organizations and siloed independent operations of things like the manage, uh, image management are no longer um, going to be effective in these organizations. And radiologists need to adapt to this new paradigm. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to lose control. In my mind, it actually believes that we extend our expertise to the benefit of the entire organization. And that applies um, primarily to the management and the imaging informatics component. I know there's also a great concern about the clinical component as ultrasound moves beyond the radiology department into many other spheres in the healthcare system, the intensive care units, the emergency department, uh, especially. And I just want to address a couple comments about that. Um, these modalities, you know, we're going to see this um, as just part of the evolution of medicine. Um, I, we can't stop it. Um, it's already happening. It's much more advanced in Europe. Uh, I think there are a lot of good things that can come out of that. And actually, um, when Dr. Munden and I were speaking, there are studies that have shown that as point of care ultrasound moves into the emergency department, actually ultrasound in the radiology department grows as well. There are some concerns about billing and there are strategies out there to allow both departments to bill. Point of care ultrasound can be billed as a limited study and by its nature should be billed as a limited study in the emergency department and could be performed as a complete study in the radiology department. That's just one example. 
in the intensive care units, people can bill for um, patient care time rather than for the ultrasound. So lots of different strategies that I don't really wanna get into today, but, to, but are out there um, to allow cooperation between radiology and these other departments. I do think radiologists should have access to these images. It's all about the comprehensive view of the patient. And these images add um, information to the patient. And I've had personal experience where a patient came into the department with a pelvic ultrasound, had told my tech that they had an ultrasound that showed something a couple weeks ago. Well, without my being able to see that something on the patient's ovary a couple weeks ago, I couldn't provide as definitive of a report to the emergency department as I might have been able to do had I been able to access those images. So we need to see those images. It really is going to impact our ability to deliver care to our patients. I know you're going to continue on with this discussion for the rest of this webinar. And I look forward to the opportunity to view the webinar and hear everyone else's comments. I'm sure that Dr. Munden, if you have any direct questions for me, Dr. Munden or the RSNA staff can forward those questions to me. So thank you very much and have a great day. So thank you for that message, Dr. Petersfield, and the need for radiologists to embrace this initiative in order to maintain some influence in the imaging domain. So now we'll go to our panel uh, discussion and encourage you to submit questions as we move along. First, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Wei to give us his thoughts and his experience with the DNA and his experience with handheld ultrasound in his institution. Uh, thank you for inviting me and I appreciate the opportunity to speak about this. Um, I uh, work with a large radiology practice that uh, covers a, uh, one of several hospitals that belongs to a large university system that uh, uh, archives all of its images in a, in a single DNA. And we found that the DNA has been a wonderful resource for our practice because patients tend to move from um, their local community hospitals or, or ERs in the, in the sort of rural areas into our um, larger metropolitan area, perhaps for a higher level of care, their oncology care, but if they need to get a bone marrow transplant, they go to the university, for example. And so there's lots of imaging that goes on for all these patients. And uh, there's several different silos where these studies are read, but the patients nevertheless are moving around within our system amongst these various facilities. So having access to the full imaging database on these patients at our fingertips has just been uh, a wonderful resource for us. We're not waiting for them just to be imported. Um, and we're, the, the reports are in our uh, EMR that are, it's a unified EMR that supports all this. So the DNA for us is, has been a, a, a really a wonderful tool the other thing that we found really valuable about DNA is that it's, it's, it's agnostic and it's, it's DICOM data that doesn't really care what kind of viewer is sitting on top of it. So you're free to go from one viewer to another to another without having to um, have proprietary software to be able to do that. And we are dealing with three or four different PAC systems between those institutions, but the data is all DICOM data. So it doesn't really matter how we're viewing and reading our individual cases. We've got access to them um, readily available. As far as point of care ultrasound, uh, we've been pretty deliberate about managing the use of point of care ultrasound to uh, very specific narrow uh, uh, ranges where um, the ER, for example, uses it for looking for pericardial fluid or for um, uh, hemoperitoneum. We use credentialing to, to, to discourage folks from, um, from doing right upper quadrant ultrasounds and pelvic ultrasounds outside of the area of expertise because they really don't have the training and expertise to be able to do what we're able to do. And we've gone so far as to encourage people to, we believe the reports, if you're going to have a, an examination there that you're going to build for, a report needs to be there. And since all that's in the VNA and available in the database, um, it, it basically shines a light on all the imaging that, that people are doing. And um, I think it, 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 it discourages the misuse of imaging for uh, for purposes that may not be uh, uh, in the patient's best interest. Um, I personally don't want to be at the bedside or be forced to be at the bedside if an ER doc wants to stick a needle into a subcutaneous fluid collection. I'm perfectly fine with them doing that. I'd rather be able to read my studies than have to get up and go to the ER and watch them do what they're going to do for 10 minutes and then come back. That's not a very that's a good use of my time. 
but they shouldn't be doing gallbladder ultrasounds and liver ultrasounds and pelvic ultrasounds comprehensively because they don't have the training and expertise to do that. And they acknowledge and represent that or recognize that. And as long as you've got a good relationship with your hospital administration and your credentialing processes, you can hold that in check. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, next, we'll go to Dr. Reed and uh, her discussion on handheld influence and radiology, particularly in the pediatric world, and a scope of practice and other issues for her. Dr. Reed. Well, thanks to RSNA, um, Highland, and to, to the group here, especially Reggie. A nice job uh, so far with this. And uh, I want to start by talking about. Uh, uh, recognizing the elephant in the room, which is that point of care ultrasound has been contentious in certain environments. Um, but I, I embrace the changes that it brings, um, provided there are some sort of rules and there is some structure that is supported by both the people using it, but also most importantly, over, overseen by and managed by radiologists who have a strong seat at the table. As a background, I worked actually in um, as a family doctor before radiology in um, a remote area, a couple of remote areas for five years. And boy, oh boy, would I have loved to have a handheld ultrasound device uh, because I had a radiologist who came in every couple of weeks. So I totally get that setting, but I think that setting is not what we're talking about here. I think that has already kind of been pretty nicely uh, perfected in many of the underserved areas. Uh, I also worked and did procedures for 12 years in my previous job, and I totally get that ultrasound guidance for procedures is absolutely the standard of care, and that I would go as far as to say that if you're putting a line in now and you don't have ultrasound at your fingertips, you're probably not performing that at standard of care. Okay, so that's, a, that's maybe an inflammatory statement, but I would say that that's pretty much par for what we're doing now. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, though, that I think there's some things we can do to really get a handle on this and work in partnership with the people doing point of care. We've, in our institution, definitely had flux with this. And we've gone through various sort of, um, it's, it's been sort of like a uh, uh, evolutionary process. First, and Bill, I, I actually highlighted as Bill was talking, I highlighted some of the things we've just, we've agreed upon. And Cheryl also outlined some of this stuff. One first is to define the scope of practice. Scope of practice, I would say, is as simple as something that is ta not time intensive, something that's timely. So a procedure that is pretty simple to perform, has to be done, there's, there's, there's going to be impact if it isn't done right away. And it's something that is not too complex, and it's something you see all the time. So it would be silly to say, let's uh, relegate bowel ultrasound as a point of care procedure when that's done maybe once or twice a year, okay? That then trickles down to teaching. If you're in an academic institution, which many of us are, even if we're not university affiliated, we must, as teachers and the POCUS teachers, must adhere to these, stand these same standards and avoid scope creep. Scope creep is not a new thing, though. We all know scope creep has happened in every aspect of, of medicine. But to have a body that oversees this will really at least help to curtail some of that. A scope of practice definition. A credentialing structure, same thing as MAMO. I can't read MAMO because I haven't had my X number of MAMO reads in, in a year. I couldn't practice radiology unless I got my CME, my maintenance of certification. So too, that should happen for point of care, avoiding sort of a two-tiered imaging structure. Patients need to be informed that they are getting a non-radiologist study. They're not getting informed in many cases. And they'll say the radiologist did an ultrasound and they'll say, whoa. And that's gonna reflect back on us as people managing radiology departments. And that is really not appropriate. I agree with Bill, I agree with Cheryl, we've gotta archive these images. I would go as far as to say, if we could develop a structured report akin to what we do for appendicitis that triggers a full study if things are not totally you know, diagnostic of whatever they're uh, looking at, and I'm not, I'm not advocating for a point of care appendix study, but I'm saying for their studies, if they're having trouble and their structured report just says, you know, this is intermediate or I'm not sure, that automatically generates a full study. And that billing, billing is probably important uh, for people doing point of care. I mean, you're, they're not doing it just for, out of the goodness of their heart. I mean, I think that you want to be compensated for your procedures. 
but the billing should be relegated to a limited study. And that should not preempt a full study within the same 24 hours that's billable in radiology. Um, the other thing that we're trying to evolve is don't pull out the point of care when we're doing clinical radiologic conferences. If, 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 if the point of care is part of your, your exam, just like your stethoscope and your physical exam is part of it, then that needs to be brought forward and that needs to be shared because we can't have images sort of hidden back and saying we did a POCUS and it showed free fluid. We have to have these things archived. We have to have these things shared on the same level. And then finally, uh, you know, a QA council and radiology should be at the head of the table for that so that there is an ability for POCUS and radiologists to discuss and to improve and to become experts in their limited scope of practice. And that involves case audits, peer review, m and whatever your system is in your place. I think those things, it's, it's surprising to me when I talk to people who are practicing it, that there's protean ways to handle POCUS. And I think first, accept that this is a part of an evolution. Second, keep maintain some oversight, some major oversight, and you're gonna find you're busier than ever actually when that those limited studies are in the purview of the POCUS. And as, as Bill says, I don't wanna get up and assist you know, without a corpus callosum, assist another doc to do a hip ultrasound while I'm looking at the hip, which is what the way a lot of these things are done now. I think we need to evolve past that. So that would be my summary um, of, of where we are with uh, point of care ultrasound. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, Susan, Dr. Ackerman, your thoughts and experience as well. So I want to thank you for um, letting me be involved in the discussion today. And there is a lot to think about. I think both um, Bill and Janet mentioned some good um, things to think about. The storage obviously is huge. I mean, images like the POCUS needs to be at a site where everyone can see them. You know, what about things like um, the report? It needs to be in a database where everyone can see the report. Currently our emergency medicine department, and we're by the way, in a fairly large academic center, has an emergency medicine ultrasound fellowship. And when they first started it several years ago, we actually saw an increase in volume in our ultrasound department because they would scan patients. And then I think they would, you know, send the patient upstairs to us to be scanned because they were checking to make sure that yes, it was a gallstone or no, or yes, it was air or an ectopic. Now we're seeing a decrease in volume from the emergency medicine because I feel after several years, they feel more comfortable, but we still can't see their images unless we actually go into their specific EPIC module. So they're not on a vendor neutral archive that we can access. We not only can't see their images very well, we can't see their report. And then what about the billing process? Are all these being billed for? And if they are concerned about an ectopic, they usually send the patient upstairs to us an ultrasound to scan. Will the patient get two bills? Is the patient being billed for that? So, and I've actually had a couple of patients say, hey, I've had this study before, you know, am I being billed again for this? Um, so access is a big issue, billing. And again, the credentialing process and quality, are there, is there a peer review process as we have in radiology, as we have in our ultrasound department? Um, is someone else looking unbiased at the study and saying, yes, this is a good study. No, this is not a good study, protocols being followed. So things like that need to be um, considered. So there, there's a lot of issues I think to, to consider with this, but if you're going to do any kind of imaging and ultrasound seems to be the biggest one, at least in our institution, the, um, we did a study, a survey a couple of years ago, and we actually saw that outside of our own radiology department, there were 200 plus ultrasound machines being used across different, in different areas, whether it be endocrine surgeon, endocrinology, rheumatology, ED. So there's a lot of machines out there. There's a lot of equipment out there. Um, and are people using the same quality is there access to it, which is the biggest ones? Because oftentimes, as they've mentioned, as radiologists, we're asked to go back, rescan the patient, or to do a CT perhaps when they saw something on ultrasound. And we want to see that 
that other study. We want to see what they're doing. Great. Thanks, Susan. So I remind people, if you have questions, please post them. We, we definitely don't want us to be just uh, talking straight at you. Um, it, does bring the, it does bring a thought of, and I think we've heard part of this, and that's the workflow issues. If all images from ultrasound, handheld ultrasounds or whatever other modality is being done, and uh, how is the report generated? How is the CPT code done and coding and billing and how is that managed? And I think, Bill, I think you may have had some experience with uh, that. Do we, you know, do we want all of these things hitting our workflow, our work queues and everything else? Those issues have to be worked out a tad. Um, if you want to comment a second or two, Bill, and then I have a general question for the whole panelists. And I'm, I'm sure if I, I follow your point about um, the coding issues, I, I think that uh, I, I believe Janet touched on this, that one of the coding problems that we run into is, is the limitations of how many times you can perform an exa a particular examination of a 24-hour cycle. And uh, that creates a bit of an issue if we've got somebody coding for an incomplete examination and then sending it to radiology to have the study done. Um, uh, I, as, I, I do, uh, so I think you, you got to convince your hospital administrators that you can't hamstring the radiology department by uh, doing the second examination as a, as a pro bono sort of examination. The other thing that I believe at least has been historically required is some, uh, even for the uh, image guide, image guided procedures that are done, you have to capture an image. And so uh, if you're going to capture an image, that needs to be stored for, for the ability to be able to build for that service. So uh, a, a, rather than have several different silos of where you're keeping all these images, a single location uh, for those in your VNA is a great place. And your, your imaging, your, your information services department will love it if they've got a single source for all the images as opposed to having to support a half dozen different silos of images of various very variable quality and and uh, identification, patient identification, and so forth. Um, so it, it has impact at a couple of different levels in that respect. Yeah, so one of the things I think most of the responses would, in, in our survey said that people don't perceive a VNA as being a threat. Uh, I'd like to pose to the panelists a scenario where that might not be such the case. Um, if, if a, a large health institution, let's just say one like we are, where we have six or eight hospitals across, a, uh, across the state, all our images are going into a VNA, um, what's to keep competitive radiology groups from going into that VNA and pulling cases? And so now we are fighting each other over cases because there's no local control of that. Or suppose there is a, a clinician who's credentialed in some modality uh, what's to stop them from going into a VNA and pulling cases out, issuing reports and DNA and, and charging for that read? Uh, that's, that's a potential uh, misuse of a VNA. And I'm just curious if any of you see that or think of that as a potential problem. Or a hospital system saying, hey, here's three radiology groups. You all have privileges. Read at your own will. So, so Reg, I think um, you really have to look at what is the compensation structure in that practice. And personally, I find an RVU-driven practice compensation structure to be the kiss of death and the most divisive thing you could do to a practice. <laughs> I'm assuming you're saying this is RVU-driven and, you know, you eat what you kill or whatever, whatever the expression is. Um, I think in, in many academic practices, that isn't as much the case and it leads to better camaraderie and less cherry picking and kind of um, stealing from each other. Um, I think it's a great source of angst for many people in many practice structures. And we don't have an RVU based system, but I'd love to hear from others who do. Well, I think almost all private groups are RVU based. Um, I'm thinking also, uh, let's say cardiac imaging, for instance, is there cardiac CT or cardiologists are credentialed to read it. And so are the radiologists. What's to stop them from going in and grabbing that case and reading it. And even though we did it, that's, is that a threat or, or is that a potential? And I, I maybe Bill, you want to 
comment first about the other thing. I'm just curious if that's sure. people think about that. I, way. I think both both of those are really relevant questions. I think to your first point about um, about outside entities and uh, uh, making images available outside beyond the, the uh, uh, scope beyond the organization itself. I think you have to have a very good relationship with your hospital administration and help them understand the importance of having a, a radiology practice that is accountable for all the images. Uh, in radiology, we read uh, all the high-end imaging, but we also read the intraoperative uh, studies that nobody else wants to read. And, and what you don't want to run into is a circumstance where uh, everybody cherry picks the from the outside, cherry picks all the studies that they want to read and leaves radiology with what's left because then your radiologists are going to leave. Um, I think the same thing applies to cardiac imaging, to have a really strong relationship with the hospital and help them understand that, um, that it's got to be a collaborative service that uh, cardiology and radiology are engaged in. And quite frankly, when it becomes a 24-hour service, I think radiology is going to be invited to participate in that. And we don't want to do everything from 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. and leave and, and not do any during, you know, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's, 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 it's got to be share and share alike. If you're going to participate in the service, you got to take call for the service. And the uh, administration's got to back you up on that. If you have a great relationship with your administration, that helps a lot. If your relationship with your administration is not great, um, you're behind the eight ball and you need to fix that. Uh, you really need to participate at all different levels in the hospital organization to facilitate your, or to, to earn your seat at the table. And then you'll be taken seriously at the uh, at, at the table where those conversations are had. Um, if you sit in the back and let things happen to you, they will happen to you. So clearly, in order for us to have some influence and maintain some influence in this whole process, I, I do think we have spent many years doing our quality, our peer review, establishing our standards, our metrics, and all that. And it's important, as you mentioned, for us to be bringing that forth to all of our administration and, and uh, staying in the lead and presenting that to, to the administration, as, especially as we move, as Janet alluded to, we move away from our view-based to value-based care. Uh, that's the one strength we truly can bring into that discussion. Uh, Susan, any thoughts uh, before I move to a question? Yeah, I was so just to comment kind of on what Bill said, it was interesting. He made the comment about if you're going to do it, you all need to offer the same level of quality. It needs to be 24 seven. So here in, in our institution, um, we tend to get all the ultrasounds that come after 5 p.m. during the night, on the weekends and on holidays. We pretty much do 100% of those unless it's localization in the ER of a fluid collection for aspiration or something. So I think it is important that leadership, administration, the health system understands the importance that radiology brings as far as quality, peer view, credentialing, um, because we expect it to be all the same, although it's, it's not always. Um, having Working in a system where we, we do most of the ultrasounds not you know not during the eight to five hours so you know reggie um i also think that uh being university universally visible does not mean necessarily that it's universally readable so that current certainly workflow streams could be developed so that um you know your day consists of your workflow stream using your workflow manager so that someone can open it read only but is not going to go snag it and start reading it um, if you have those issues, that's the stick. I mean, the carrot is the communication and relationships, uh, which is incredibly important uh, as well. Yeah, certainly. And I think, I think ultimately, even with a VNA, most of us will have uh, overlay readers that are tailored to our practices, right? Cardiology, we have theirs, we'll have ours. Uh, there's a question in the, in the question box, and it's, it kind of alludes a little bit to what I was asking how, how do we know that there is a handheld ultrasound image that's relevant to what we're doing? It's not going to necessarily be in our packs. It's going to be in the VNA. How would we? How do? How would we know that? How would other than being on the history of the report? I don't know that we would, right? Yeah. Currently, I mean, at our institution, I wouldn't know that unless the clinician 
And occasionally they do call and say, we were concerned about the gallbladder. There was a report out there that says, oh, there could be air, but then I can't look at the images. I don't know where they are or they're deposited in some database that I don't have access to in another module in EPIC that maybe the ER works in or some other group. So that's a good question. Unless someone currently tells me, here's what you need to do to find it. Here's where you have to look. I have no idea where it is. Somewhat okay. analogous to outside imaging, right? Outside X ray yeah. studies that are commented upon sometimes. Sorry, Janet. I'm sorry. Um, uh, we have them stored right in the packs, and we have access to our um, echocardiography in the not the packs, but in in Epic, which is easy to access. So once that navigation is understood, um, we can actually see the point of care ultrasound right before ours, uh, and it's it's. Um, not always clear what they're looking at, but it's there. And we encourage them to tell us that when they're at sending someone for a bona fide study, that there has been this other study as well. There may be communication with the with the ER doc. Yeah, it's, it's become second nature to us. Um, in uh, we read from a from a bona fide PACS or, or but but we have ready access to the full database. And within the full database is a thin client viewer that has a, that allows you to see in the DNA. So, if I'm wondering what is you know maybe my PAC doesn't have that study, my, it's almost second nature to me to go to the DNA and see what's in the DNA. And lo and behold, you'll find a study that you didn't have that somebody else dropped in there from a point of care ultrasound. And now all of a sudden, you, it becomes patently obvious what you were looking at. So you're right, it doesn't get dragged into my packs, but as long as you've got ready access to the DNA through a clinical viewer, um, not a diagnostic viewer necessarily, you, 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 can, you can pretty quickly figure out what the source of the question was. You just gotta do a little bit of bird dogging. Is there a mechanism or should we work with the vendors and the, that we would have a key or some way of tagging images so that they could be brought into a, a relevant image? So if a uh, handheld, you know, maybe as we sometimes store outside images in our packs, right? They're, they are identified as OSF or some terminology where we know they're not to be interpreted by us, but they are available. Uh, do, do any of you currently do that with point of care ultrasound or anything of that nature? Or is that something we could get the VNA vendors to perhaps work on? If, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in our uh, practice, uh, we have a tool that's able to re do read the DICOM headers. And so when it when it takes in an outside study, it views the DICOM headers and it assigns a, the name of the examination. So it may not be as granular as, as you might like, but it, it, it'll at least give you the modality and probably give you the body part so that uh, you uh, it, uh, it may not be exactly what you use for your procedure code internally, but at least when it pops up on the work list, or in the timeline, it's got a, it's from the DICOM header. Interesting. So Janice asking this question and it's interesting you would ask about Butterfly. I think many of you, if you're not aware of Butterfly, they have a pretty unique tool that's a probe that hooks into a iPad or a handheld device. We actually at MUSC here, uh, our regional hospital network is now a site where they're deploying butterflies all over to, all over for the clinicians and sites to use. The technology I'm not familiar with, but I suspect it's you know pretty is good enough, shall I say, for them to have. Um, and we are we are not we haven't resolved where those images and how those images will be stored yet. So. Here, we're, here we are talking about it, and we're, we, Susan and I, are getting ready to be faced by this very same question. I, I do feel, I do think that if an image is used for any diagnosis, it has to be stored of some kind, or if a procedure, as Bill mentioned, is done, where something is done, then at least one of those images needs to be captured, much like we do with fluoroscopy or any biopsy procedure. We, we capture at least a critical image and put it in the packs. Um, if they're using the handhelds for minor things, you know, line placements and stuff of that nature, most of us don't feel that I need to have all those images put in there. But you could argue line placements one of those where you should at least verify you the line is where you think it is. Um, but I don't know if any other 
any of the others have comments on the, the proliferation of the smaller handheld units. I will tell you the vendors now are getting into this market too because they see a big market in these small handheld units. Do you have them anywhere? Susan, you look like you have to say something. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, just tagging onto what Reggie mentioned. I mean, a lot of um, medical schools are giving them to their students and they're using them, they're learning to use them. I mean, when some of us went through medical school, we, had, we probably had no exposure or very little exposure to ultrasound. And now first and second year students are getting them and using the handheld ultrasounds and becoming much more comfortable. So I just see it as a field that's, that's growing. And of course it's much less expensive than the ones that we have in radiology than the machines that we use, like to look at transplant patients, hepatic vasculature and things like that. So I think it's just going to grow, the volume's going to grow hugely. I mean, I was even, someone even mentioned me the other day, they said, what's to stop just the average person from buying it and carrying it around in their purse? using it whenever they want to look at something. Well, I would expect that to happen in, in, uh, at the front line with people coming in with images. Um, the one thing that has come up with us is uh, now that we are actually uh, talking about uh, should radiology trainees have the same access to these as the other residents that are throughout the system to level the playing field. Um, and so that's a very important thing to think about. Now they're expensive. Um, you'd have to think about a budget somehow for those. But um, I think for us to be in the game, we probably need to know what the game is and what, you know, what, what the rules of the game are. Um, the thing that bothered me a little is what is the share, what's the sharing arrangement of the cloud-based storage files, stored files? And what is your code of ethics? So are you going to say this is for teaching only so you can do you or your family members? Or what's to stop you from, oh, I need a really good picture of that for paper. I'm going to go in there and take a patient image, but I, I'll just pretend it's a family image. Um, we really need to define that very carefully for the purposes of PHI. And uh, again, another, another form of creep. And again, it's not insurmountable. It's just a new challenge, right? New challenge. Definitely more technology, and I think all of us are going to be faced with increasing loads of it for sure. I'm sure that you'll be able to Google it soon and find anything you need to know how to use a handheld ultrasound unit or something in the future. And I don't know, part of me is like, maybe I'll just get one and take it home as well and play with it. But uh, I, I think it's an intriguing technology, but it's certainly going to impact uh, us somehow as to how do we store the, do we and how do we store those images? And what's the responsibility of radiologists if they're stored? Are we supposed to be looking at them? And, and obviously the, the potential misuse of those, I, I, you know, you can be concerned of people who are having a baby ultrasound in their baby every half an hour or something, and we may not know the full extent of that. Well, I, I, I want to thank everybody for uh, contributing to this. I appreciate the audience and, uh, and everyone for giving uh, their thoughts on this. I do think it's going to be a continuing uh, and growing business of VNAs displacing current PAC systems. Pathology, if pathology goes to full digital, they will be a bigger user than radiology is in this field. Uh, so but now it's radiology and cardiology, but ultimately it will be radiology, cardiology, and pathology with large, huge, massive database storages, but other clinicians as well. So I think there's a lot to be worked out. I do feel that radiologists, we've been doing this, as I mentioned, 30, 40 years. We've got a lot of experience in it, and, and we have expertise that we should offer to contribute, as Bill mentioned, and make sure that we're at least in the discussion with our administrators. And hopefully that's how we're going to maintain our influence in this domain, our quality metrics, our and, uh, expertise, and, and convince them that scope of practice, credentialing, and quality are really important in this world. So any final comments uh, from any of my panelists? All right. Well, Bill, we thank you all for uh, participating and uh, appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you all.